I see the work of your hands Galaxies spinning in a heavenly dance Oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming I hear the sound of your voice All at once it's a gentle and thundering noise Oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming I delight myself in you Captivated by your beauty I'm overwhelmed I'm overwhelmed by you God, I run into your arms Unashamed because of mercy I'm overwhelmed I'm overwhelmed by you I know the power of your cross Forgiven and free Forever you'll be my God And all that you've done Is so overwhelming I delight myself in you Captivated by your beauty I'm overwhelmed I'm overwhelmed by you And God, I run into your arms Unashamed because of mercy I'm overwhelmed I'm overwhelmed by you You are beautiful You are beautiful Oh God There is no one more beautiful You are beautiful You are the most beautiful You are wonderful You are wonderful Oh God There is no one more wonderful You are wonderful You are the most wonderful You are glorious You are glorious Oh God There is no one more glorious You are glorious You are the most glorious I delight myself in you Captivated by your beauty I'm overwhelmed I'm overwhelmed by you God, I run into your arms Unashamed because of mercy I'm overwhelmed I'm overwhelmed by you I'm overwhelmed I'm overwhelmed by you Could I have a little more of my guitar and her vocals in the monitor? Shine among us, his glory 
could ever come close No thing can compare You're our living hope Your presence, Lord I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of love Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for To be overcome by your presence, Lord Your presence, Lord Okay, so this morning we're going to land in Romans 1, or the fourth week in a row. And as you guys are getting situated there, let me remind you that last week at the end of 
our sermon, we looked at the three I am statements of Paul. And so there Paul is contemplating the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 14, I am a debtor. That's his first I am statement. He senses his responsibility based upon the Lord having shed his love abroad in Paul's heart. He says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to barbarians, to the cultured and to the uncultured, to share the gospel with anyone across the empire. And then in verse 15, that leads him to share his readiness. He says, I am ready to come to Rome and share the gospel with you. I want to come to you specifically and share the gospel. And then that leads us to the 16th verse. His responsibility coupled with his readiness leads to this realization. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Paul's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So let's think about shame for just a second. If Paul's not ashamed, what is shame? Shame is the feeling that I am not enough. Maybe it's more than that. It's the feeling that I will never be enough. And when we think about shame, the core fear of shame is actually abandonment, being alone, being unloved. And yet, interestingly enough, As shame fleshes itself out in a person's life dominated by shame, shame causes us to isolate, excuse me, to do the exact opposite of what we actually want and need. So shame is the feeling I'll never be enough. Now, that feeling of never being enough stems from the lies of shame. And the two main lies of shame are this. Number one, again, you are not enough. And then number two, you need to be enough. And we find this all the way back in the garden. If you want to turn to Genesis 3 with me, you'll find that shame was actually Satan's primary scheme against Adam and Eve in the garden. We pick up in Genesis 3, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning, verse 1, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, the serpent, said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Or verse 5, God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so here's the temptation, you're not enough the way God made you. If you'll eat of the fruit, then you'll be enough. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she also gave to her husband with her, and they ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. So you see, shame was Satan's primary scheme. You're not enough, but you need to be enough, so here's the way you can be enough. And yet, shame was Satan's primary scheme, but shame is also a primary result of Satan's scheme. You see, Before the fall, they were, well, chapter 2, verse 25 says, they both were naked, Adam and Eve, the man and his wife, and they were not what? Ashamed. They were not ashamed. They were enough, just the way God created them. 
He created everything and pronounced it good. But then you notice after the fall, they hide themselves with fig leaves and God comes down to walk with them in the cool of the day as he always does. And when he can't find them, he says, hey, where are you? And in verse 10 of chapter 3 of Genesis, Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. They were hiding in shame. They were hiding in shame. So shame is a direct result of the fall. Now, the core effects of shame we also find in Genesis 3. And the core effect of shame for us is fractured relationship. First, we see in Genesis 3, fractured relationship with God. Immediately, there was no longer that intimate connection. They're hiding themselves because of their shame. They don't feel like they're enough. And in fact, at that point, they weren't enough. So they hid themselves and they covered themselves with works of their own hands, the fig leaf skirts and fig leaf dressings they made there. And so they are broken in their relationship with God. And then they are also, as we look at this, they're quick to have their relationship because of shame broken with others. So our relationship is immediately broken with God because of shame. And then relationship broken with others. How is it broken with others? When God comes down and, and he asks them, hey, did you eat of the tree that was in the midst of the garden? And then Adam blurts out what? Hey, it was the woman that you gave me. That's why I ate. So immediately the blame game starting. With others, we blame others and we cover up our own sin, our own shame. And so we see this. Actually, Adam's blaming God and he's blaming his wife. When God asks Eve, hey, he says, Eve, did you eat? It was the serpent that tricked me, right? So we blame others because of shame, and we cover up to try to hide our shame. And what that actually leads to is fractured relationship, again, with God, with others, but then even with ourselves because the core effect of shame personally is self-loathing. That shame turns me in on myself I cannibalize who God created me to be because I don't feel like I measure up. And so what happens that as we embrace the lies of shame, we actually uh, carry with us the posture of shame. And the key posture of shame is uh, head down, no eye contact. If you've ever been ashamed, in that second, head down, no eye contact. If you feel not enough and you walk into a crowd, head down, no eye contact. Just let me get through this thing so that I don't have to deal with the shame or no one will see my shame. And so as the inscription is on the illustration there, shame is a soul-eating emotion. It really is. It stems from the fall. Now, why must I deal with shame? And by dealing with shame, deal with it in a godly way. Because, first off, shame drowns out the voice of the Spirit of God in my life. You see, shame whispers things into my heart and my life that aren't true about me. And if I listen to shame, I won't be able to hear the voice of God. In fact, um, St. Teresa of Avila, she was a 16th century Catholic saint and mystic. I like a lot of what she did. I read about her from time to time, but there's a lot of legend surrounding her. Maybe many would consider it Catholic folklore. But Teresa wrote a lot about spiritual warfare. She claimed that in her life, Satan personally would show up and harass her. And so one of the most interesting stories about St. Teresa of Avila was that one morning she was in the commode and she was praying there on the commode to the Lord. And of course, that was rare for a Catholic at that time to have intimacy with God at all. So the fact that she would admit that she was praying on the commode was a big deal. But there she says, Satan came to her and said, how dare you on the commode pray to the living God? How could you pray so openly while on the commode? And Teresa of Avila said, that she looked at Satan and she said, well, 
what's coming out of my lips is for God, and what's coming out of my other end is for you. <laughs> she wasn't affected by the, the lie of shame, right? Shame is always going to tell us we're less than. And I would say that shame is one of the big reasons that corporate prayer in church suffers to this day. There are people that powerfully pray privately, and then they get in a group, and they won't pray because they're ashamed that they can't pray right, or they won't say something correctly, or they're embarrassed, and you go on and on and on. But it's shame literally drowning out the Spirit of God as He uses us in corporate prayer to speak uh, through each other and to each other. Now, that said, shame makes me want to avoid being with God because I feel unworthy of His affection. That's why I need to deal with it. Because shame literally cuts me off from the affection of the Father because I don't feel like I measure up. It's hard to be intimate with anyone that you feel has something against you or you don't measure up to their expectations. And so what happens if we don't deal with shame in Christ, by the gospel of Christ, I'm not ashamed of the power of God because this salvation releases me from shame. Not afraid of that salvation. And we embrace Christ as the only way to rid us of the shame that came through the fall. If we don't do that, then the only other way we can deal with shame is to try harder in my own strength. And in fact, there are some psychologists that would say that much of the workaholism in our country is people trying to deal with shame. I'm trying to measure up to whatever I have made up in my mind is the expectation that will give me worth. And so shame causes me to try harder in my own strength, but here's the problem. Since shame has its systemic roots at the fall, shame can only be dealt with at the root through a transformed life in Jesus Christ. And so if you try to just fix the symptoms, then there's no long-term result that will give you lasting peace and deal with your shame outside of Jesus Christ. So then what happens is I work, 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 work to try to make myself worthy so I don't feel ashamed. But then eventually what happens is when the work, work, work doesn't result in peace, then I just give up altogether. And then what can happen is I'm not ashamed of anything. Now, this isn't new to our culture, but I believe it's where our culture is headed, where not letting God, the gospel of Christ, be the answer for shame. Sure, we've got each of us something to be ashamed of spiritually, we're born broken with God, and then we prove that out as we sin. But used to, even in our culture, it was okay to call certain things sin. And then now we can, calling it sin, realize that we lack, and so we give that to God, and He changes us, and now we can have release from that sin through transformation. But increasingly, as our society, and then even the Christian church, won't call sin sin, and won't look at our own fracturedness and find our only atonement in Christ Jesus, then we work to take care of our own sin, but then once we can't find lasting peace from our sin, our shame, then we just have to do this. We have to just ignore it altogether and not call anything shameful. So we do this in our culture, but it's not new to us. In fact, if you want to go all the way back to Jeremiah... The Israelites, who had a much more godly tradition early on than even America did, they rejected the law of the Lord. And in rejecting the law of the Lord, they made all these extra commandments to try to govern their lives. And when those extra commandments, on top of the 613 they had in the law of the Lord, didn't give them release from their guilt and their shame, then they just stopped calling anything shameful. And so we find that the Lord writes to them in the 13th verse, from the least of them, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 13, from the least of them, 
even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the herd of my people slightly. The prophet and the priest have just barely healed the herd of my people. And this is how they've healed it. They've glossed over the herd. They said, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed, verse 15 says, when they had committed abomination? No. They were not at all ashamed. Look at this. Nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall at the time I punish them. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. And so what happens is that there is a point where not calling things shameful and giving them to the Lord and our works not taking care of that shame, well, then we get to a point where we just have to say nothing is shameful, right? And yet, we still have to deal with it. So the blame game happens. Other people have shameful acts, but not me. And you see it right now, the way that people who have been dealt wrongfully with, they are calling out other people's shameful acts in an attempt to deal with their shame, the Me Too movement, hashtag Me Too. We see this with race as evolved and well in our culture. People have been made to feel shameful, so instead of giving those things to Christ Jesus and having them dealt with, the way that we deal with it is we say, now my identity is going to become the shame that has been perpetrated upon me. And so now I'm going to tell my story, and I'm going to empower others to tell their story but you see, none of it really gets rid of the key issue. The key issue is deep down, shame, that only can be dealt with by the blood of Jesus Christ. So why must I deal with it? Because it will make me work myself to the bone, or it will make me give up and be unashamed of anything. I won't know how to blush at anything anymore. Now, let me ask you this. How did Jesus deal with shame? And that's important. Because this is what makes the gospel of Christ such good news. Our Savior, God in the flesh, He Himself felt and dealt with shame. So how did Jesus deal with shame? There are a couple places to look. And they are both very popular. You know the stories probably. But Luke chapter 4 is the most detailed account of Jesus' temptation in the desert. And here Jesus is fasting. The enemy comes, Satan, to tempt him. And as he comes to tempt him, what you realize as you read through the account is that Satan is running the exact same playbook he ran at Adam and Eve in the garden. Satan doesn't have a ton of plays. He just runs them really well. He says, hey, I'm going to sweep right, and you can't stop me. His three plays are this, from John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's how he's going to tempt. And so he comes to Jesus, who's starving, and says, Hey, if you are really the Messiah, if you're really the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. So what he's saying is, if you are really enough... If you're really who you say you are, turn these stones into bread. And then he goes on and tempts him by, in another spot, taking him up and showing him all the nations of the world. And, and then he says, hey, guess what? I'll give you all these if you'll just bow down and worship me. What he's saying is you're not enough. What he was really offering Jesus was a shortcut for what he knew was enough. But then he takes him too onto the temple and he says, hey, throw yourself down in front of all these people and, uh, and if you live, then you'll basically be showing them that, what? You're enough. Be enough in your own strength. You're either not enough or you can be enough in your own strength. And how did Jesus deal with the temptations of Satan? Interestingly enough, he didn't use his superhuman God powers. He, he didn't put on his cape. And this is important because when Jesus walked this earth, he did everything just as you and I. He did everything under the complete submission to the Spirit. And so he was led, or in some cases, your Bibles will say driven into the wilderness to be tempted by the Spirit. But then there 
under the influence of the Spirit. This is the three ways that he, in fact, dealt with temptation. Verse 4 of Luke 4, he said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written. Written where? In the Scriptures. Then in verse 8, he says, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written. It is written where? In the Scriptures. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And then finally, he is tempted by Satan, and in verse 12, he answers, and he says, It has been said, where? In the Old Testament, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. How did Satan get beat back with his shameful schemes when he tempted Jesus? By the Word of God, which you and I have at our disposal in a way that really generations before us never had. We have more ability to have the Word of God with us than ever before. And so Jesus shunned shame with Scripture. And what you put in, in the truth, then what it does is it drives out the falsehood. Now on the cross, he had a different type of shame, much worse, in fact, I would submit to you. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, I mentioned this to you last week. Paul writes there, I believe it's the writer is Paul. We'll thumb wrestle over it. Some of you say Barnabas. Some of you erroneously say it could be Apollos. But... Um, Let's just call it Paul. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he despised the cross, uh, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we mentioned this in brief last week. He endured the cross, and yet he endured it despising the shame. Now, the shame for Jesus on the cross was, I'd say, at least threefold. Uh, emotionally, he was shamed. We looked at Wednesday night when we studied through Mark, him being beaten, him being spat upon, him being mocked by the soldiers. I mean, emotionally, he was drugged through the shameful ringer. And then, secondly, relationally, he was shamed. The scriptures tell us that every person that he ever invested in and loved on abandoned him except John and a handful of women. So you think about the, the multitudes that just a week earlier are throwing their clothes on the ground and they're waving palm branches and they're screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. I mean, this is our Savior, not a one around. Complete abandonment. And sometimes that's relationally, that abandonment is as hard to handle as any other kind. When you think you can trust someone, when you put your, your heart out and have somebody just chop it off and leave you hanging, everybody left him except just a handful. And then, finally, and most substantially, his abandonment was spiritually. It says in Isaiah that he was marred more than any man. The idea was that you couldn't even tell he was a man, his visage had been so marred. And certainly that was probably the case because of the beating, and it was probably the case because of the flogging. But I would submit to you that past that, it was the case because uh, Jesus Christ, him who knew no sin, is what Corinthians says, became sin for you and I. And so you think about every sin you've ever committed. Just... Let the ones run through your mind that maybe those closest to you know about, that you've been open enough to admit. Now, now let all those run through your mind that maybe no one knows, and that if they knew, you would certainly experience the feeling of shame. Now, you take every sin that you could think of throughout your life in this brief moment, and you pile it on top of Jesus on the cross. He's going to feel what you felt in that moment. In your, in your worst spot of, of being shamed or your worst spot of being angry or the greediest you ever felt or just the most lascivious, the sickest you've ever been lustfully. And you put that on Christ and then you take that out to every person who's ever walked the planet in however long we've been around, whether you're a young earth guy or an old earth gal, and we're going we're gonna to pile that on Jesus Christ and he who never had known a sin 
became all those things. He experienced those things in his person so that he could take them upon himself. And then Colossians tells us that the handwriting of requirements that is written against us, God's meticulous bookkeeper, every sin you and I have ever committed is apparently listed. It, those sins nailed to the cross with Jesus. And as he bore those sins when he died, guess what? He rose again. And for those of us who believe in him, those sins stayed there. But the shame, the shame of every person's sin throughout eternity, he wore it, he embraced it, and so he endured the cross, despising the shame. But how did he get through it? Number one, it says here, for the joy that was set before him. That's two parts. The joy of what? The joy of his fulfilling the will of the Father. He knew what was going to be on the other side. But most significantly, the joy that is talked about there is those who he would redeem, you and I. So Jesus endured shame by finding joy in God's will and in God's people. Let me encourage you to do that as well, to find joy in God's person, his will. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength, and then let that happen through God's people or with God's people. And so Jesus dealt with shame through putting Scripture in to drive shame out, and then embracing the joy of the Lord's will in his life and enjoying God's people. Now, uh, finally, this leads Paul to say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. If he doesn't say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, he can't truly say, I'm not ashamed. I am not ashamed by itself would be an incomplete statement. But he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God to salvation. It's the power of God to salvation. The gospel of Christ deals with shame. That's why Paul could say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And then he would say, it is for this salvation, everyone who believes, the Jew first and then the Greek. It's for everyone. This is also something that Paul can relish in if he would say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is for me. And that would be a less enthusiastic statement, especially if it wasn't for you, right? Oh, man, I've got something that's changed my life, but won't work for you. Man, I no longer have any shame, but sorry, you're just going to get to swim around, keep your head above water in your pool of shame. And yet what Paul says is the gospel's for anyone who believes, anyone and everyone. And so what the gospel does is it deals with my guilt and it deals with my shame. Note this, guilt is dealt with by forgiveness. Shame is dealt with by acceptance and unconditional love. And so what John wrote the only man we know of to be standing at the cross with the ladies who were so faithful. He wrote this in John chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 11. He, Jesus, came to his own, his own people and his own nation, and his own did not receive him. But here's the transitionary word in verse 12 of John 1. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so the gospel accepts me as I am, but then the gospel changes who I am. It makes me better than I am. You see, and here's the issue with a culture that can't blush anymore. They want to be accepted as they are, but they don't want to change. Accept me as I am, and then let me stay as I am. But the gospel of Christ says, man, any way you come, you will be accepted. 
but you have not experienced the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the cross if you stay the way you are. God is in the transformation business. So the gospel accepts me as I am, but makes me better than I am. It deals with my guilt, with forgiveness. It deals with my shame, with love and acceptance. Again, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, you and I, through Christ, we are accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. And so today, if you look at the little illustration over to the side, if you're hiding in guilt and shame, if, you, if you're afraid that someone might figure out who you really are, you don't have to listen very hard to hear the Father's footsteps, or maybe his still small voice, you might put it that way. He's looking for you, he's speaking to you, he wants to restore you. He don't, doesn't want to let shame continue to be the dominant narrative in your life. What the enemy wants to say is, this thing is the final say in your life, but let me encourage you, this thing is not the final say in your life. You know what the final say in your life is? Jesus Christ. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. And so this morning, Vic, would you come up just uh, and I want to have Vic pick the guitar just for a, a few minutes before we uh, close. And if you guys would kill the lights, uh, we don't normally have altar calls and this is not going to be one. And uh, a lot of people come from traditional church to here and they really are missing something when we don't have altar calls and they express deep disconnection because of experiences they've had with altar calls. And I'll, I'll just share this with you. One of the reasons we specifically don't do altar calls is because they can become a crutch for Christians where they believe that's the only place that you meet Jesus. That's the only place people can come down and get saved. And the reality is, I want you to understand that people are probably going to meet Jesus through interactions with you by the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you to make it your mission to lead people to Jesus, to help people grow in their walk with Christ. And while we want certainly you to be met by the Lord through His Holy Spirit here, we don't want to act like this is the spot. I give the pitch or I have you come down that that's the thing that will do it. But this morning what I want to do, it's a smaller crowd. We've got a few minutes left because for the first time in 12 and a half years, I went a little short. I would like to do this. I really feel like shame is something that dominates our life if it's not spoken out. And so um, because it hides and continues to lie, it's never exposed, it becomes the driving force in our life. And so James says, hey, confess your sins one to another because there's a lot of freedom. If something's not hidden, it can't bind you up. It can't keep you uh, whispering in your ear if they just knew that about you. And so uh, what I'm going to do here this morning is just ask if, uh, if you'd like to have shame dealt with, specific shame, then grab somebody next to you and go down to the altars and pray together, maybe confess together what you believe might be pertinent, safe. If you'd like to pray with me, I'm going to sit right down here. I would have other elders come down, but we're not here because of the ice and the snow. And uh, we're just going to let Vic play for a bit and give you guys time to respond. And if you don't move... Don't be ashamed. Father God, we thank you and we praise you for this uh, morning. We ask that you would let there be release from shame by the power of your spirit. And we pray that you'd use these next few minutes as we meditate, and maybe confess that you'd, that you'd bless us, Lord, that you'd, that you'd pour out your spirit upon us and that you would that let us feel whole and enough in you. In Jesus' name we pray.